like to thank the Oliver Center for videotaping our lunch bunches, and th those are on the lunch bunch uh, website. So if you go to UTMB homepage and uh, search for lunch bunch, you'll get a link, and you'll have all the videotapes of um, most of the lunch bunches we've had. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Gordon Klein. Uh -huh. Dr. Gordon Klein uh, works with our Healthy Brown Clinic here and is. Uh, has a great big long resume, but what you want to hear about is all that he has to tell you about preventing um, fractures and how to treat fractures once you have them and prevent more. So Dr. Klein, without further ado, huh. we'll hand it over to you and then after Dr. Klein is huh. finished speaking, Sukhwan Jolly huh. is going to talk about uh, good eats, ways to support um, your bones by eating well. So take it away. We're glad to have oh, you here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I have to tell you that I cringed when I saw the title of this talk. Uh, I was uh, very much afraid that uh, the people were going to come here expecting Billy Ray Cyrus. <laughs> <laughs> looking, for, looking at the size of the group, I'm wondering if that wasn't the case. I'm, 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 I'm sorry to disappoint in any case. Um, well, you all have a handout, and um, I, I tend to work from these because uh, I think sometimes when you see slides, especially after lunch in a darkened room, um, I tend to drift off. I don't know about you all. Um, so. What I want to do, if you can follow me along on this, uh, we're going to cover certain categories. The first is, why are bones important any, anyway? Um, what happens to them as we age? What are the consequences of losing bone? How do you diagnose it? How do you treat it? And how do you prevent it? And then finally, a little bit about a clinic that we've recently started, which we aim to try and prevent people from having fractures or if they've had one to prevent a second one. Okay, so first of all, why are bones important? Well, the obvious, obviously, it's your body's structural framework. Everything hangs on them and they kind of give you a border, so to speak. Um, but also, bones contain marrow and often we don't uh, necessarily associate the marrow with the bone, but they are part and parcel of the same organ. And uh, <clears throat> the bone marrow, uh, you may well know, make, makes red, cell, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, immune cells, fat cells, muscle cells, bone forming cells, which are called osteoblasts, and bone degrading cells, which are called osteoclasts. And the marrow and the bone, the outer bone, are actually in constant conversation with each other. We don't fully know the <clears throat> all the, the nuances of these conversations, but clearly something directs the marrow to make certain kinds of cells and not others. So <clears throat> this is in development, and what we have obviously is you know a lot of interaction here. The other thing is that recently we've found out that these bone forming cells or osteoblasts produce a protein <coughs> that we call osteocalcin. And this protein stimulates the pancreas to make insulin and stimulates the muscles to take up more glucose in response to the insulin. So in, in fact, may play a role in diabetes. We didn't know this and we're still not fully sure precisely how this works, but there is a relationship between the bone and diabetes and energy metabolism. Also, there is some very new information that suggests that bone may play a role in regulating the actual amount of muscle that we have. Uh, it's not entirely clear yet how this works, but there's some evidence that suggests that it does something. And then, of course, finally, probably what you all knew is that bone is a storehouse or a warehouse uh, for certain minerals that the body needs for its metabolism, including calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. So they're, they're, they can always 
take it out of the bone if there is a metabolic need for them. Okay. <clears throat> now the other thing is, of course, if there are any questions, just raise your hand. Well, we can, you know, because sometimes as we go through a presentation, people tend to forget what they're going to ask. Um, what happens to bone as we age? Well, all of us reach a maximum or peak bone mass uh, when we are in our 20s. From your early 30s, you begin to lose bone imperceptibly, but by time, especially women <coughs> at menopause, uh, with the loss of estrogen, bone loss is accelerated. And the reason for this <coughs> is that estrogen appears to have a role in promoting bone formation and curbing bone resorption or breakdown. So as you lose your estrogen, you lose your control over this. Now what about men? Men get osteoporosis too. Um, well, what happens is that testosterone is actually, or at least in part, metabolized to estrogen in the body. And it's that amount of estrogen that actually uh, performs the same function as it does in women. It protects the bone, it stimulates bone formation, and tempers bone breakdown. So the result of this, then, is that there's a net loss of bone as you age. But there's an additional complication here, and that is that as we age, our skin becomes less efficient at converting or at having sunlight convert um, the vitamin D precursor in the skin to actual vitamin D. You know, you've heard that, you know, you go out in the sun for 20 minutes and you have, uh, you know, you, you have all the vitamin D that you need. Well, yes, when you're young, but not so when you're older. So once you have a reduction in that efficiency, if you're not on a supplement of vitamin D, you will develop either vitamin D insufficiency or, vitam or frank vitamin D deficiency. When you develop vitamin D deficiency, what happens is that the absorption of calcium from the diet actually decreases. And when it decreases, your blood calcium level drops. That's sensed by four little glands around your thyroid called your parathyroid glands. And they produce a hormone called PTH or parathyroid hormone. What this hormone does is it's essentially responsible for normalizing the calcium level in your blood. So what it will do is it will then go to the bone and start breaking it down. And as it breaks down, it liberates the calcium that's in it. And that will help normalize the levels. The other thing it does is it goes to the kidney. And it does two things in the kidney. Number one is it blocks the kidney from excreting calcium, so it preserves it. It also stimulates the synthesis of a metabolically active form of vitamin D called 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. Long name, uh, and you can abbreviate it as calcitriol. What this form of vitamin D does is it actually goes back to the intestine and stimulates more efficient calcium absorption from the diet. So this is one of your body's checks and balances. And uh, this is, uh, but by doing so, the bone pays a price. The bone loses in all this. And so PTH can cause, as, as a result of vitamin D deficiency or even insufficiency, can cause the loss of bone. So in addition to the loss of estrogen, the lack of vitamin D or adequate amounts of vitamin D will combine to accelerate that bone loss. So what else will cause bone loss? Well, a lot of us as we age develop 
chronic inflammatory diseases. So things like arthritis, those who are unfortunate enough to have lupus uh, or inflammatory bowel disease, a variety of other chronic inflammatory conditions that sometimes are better, sometimes are worse. The inflammation itself produces, or there are cells that, uh, that, are, that are inflammatory cells, white blood cells, will actually produce a substance called a cytokine. And many of these actually go to the bone and cause resorption. Um, we're not 100% sure why, but we think it's because calcium is also necessary to foster inflammation. So the result of this is you've got two, maybe three uh, reasons to lose bone as you age. But there are others too, um, conditions like type 2 diabetes. There's something about it, we don't really understand what yet, but it's <clears throat> whatever happens within the marrow, there is more, the, the cells that normally produce bone cells switch to producing fat cells. And so you've got a lot of what we call adipocytes in the bone marrow at that time. And that with fewer bone cells, even though you're not breaking down the bone, you're not producing it. And so you have essentially weaker bone. Okay, so these are the, some of the things that we deal with as, as we age. And um, so we now have to go on to uh, the consequences of bone loss. We now have some idea of what's happening and the next question really is, so what? Well, the first thing that you have to know, and I, and, and I think this is really critically important, is that like high blood pressure, bone loss is silent. You have no idea that you're losing bone, none, unless you have a fall, you break something. Um, so the most common sites of fracture uh, due to osteoporosis or severe bone loss most, uh, are the hip and the spine. And the spine, these are actually spontaneous, what we call compression fractures, where the, the vertebrae, instead of being normally spaced, actually shrink down. And these aren't necessarily traumatic. These just occur, um, and usually due to weakened bone. And <clears throat> once you have them, they're painful, they're difficult to fix. They can be addressed, but uh, it, they're extremely uncomfortable. Hip fractures are another issue entirely, because not only are they painful, but they're very dangerous. Uh, roughly one in five people who suffer a hip fracture can die in the first year following the fracture. So this is very significant. Uh, a lot of the times it's from immobilization and the development of blood clots or deep venous thromboses that then break off and go to your lungs and uh, you get a pulmonary embolus. So these, are, these are, are, are really important issues. Um, many of these fractures with bone loss, uh, the type of fracture that we find particularly prevalent is something called a low trauma fracture or a fragility fracture. And basically what this means is that you will fracture if you fall from your standing height. You're not on a ladder you know, repairing your roof, you're not, uh, you know, you're, you're not skateboarding uh, necessarily. You understand you may trip and fall, but that height difference uh, is enough to cause a fracture, whereas in most people with normal strength, bones of normal strength, that wouldn't occur, okay? So that leaves us to the next point, 
which is how do you diagnose bone loss? How, how do you know it's even there? Well, if it's silent, there's nothing to even ignore. So people really kind of have to be screened. And um, the most widely available screening tool, you may have heard of something called a DEXA or a, a bone density test. Basically what this is, <coughs> is if for, how many of you have had one, by the way? Okay, so I, I don't have to tell you what, that it's, it's not painful. Um, for those of you who have not had one, uh, it, it's absolutely nothing to be feared. It's not like a colonoscopy. Uh, the, um, so this, uh, so what this does, I mean basically this is a computer. You lie down on, your, on the table, this x-ray machine um, scans you, it actually doesn't give you any more radiation than a, a, a typical chest x-ray. But the computer underneath uh, actually is receptive to two different type, uh, types of x-rays. One is a high energy x-ray, the other is a low energy x-ray. And as these x-rays pass through tissues of different density, they can sort out what is hard tissue, and the only hard tissue we have is bone, what is soft tissue, um, and um, what's fat. And so actually a lot of these machines are now used even to assess body composition. How much bone do you have? How much fat do you have? Uh, how much muscle? Or actually the, 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 what they call the lean body mass is a little harder to assess because uh, it doesn't, it, it confuses soft tissue in water. So if you happen to have a lot of water or a lot of swelling, it's not very good uh, at that. But it'll certainly tell you how much fat you have as well. Um, <clears throat> so this tool uh, should be used for women who have just passed the menopause and for men when they reach the age of 70. This is the right now the, the, the current guideline. Uh, now, what does the bone density do? And it gives you this calculation, but what it does is it determines something called a T-score. Now, I don't know where they actually got the term T, but uh, what it essentially tells you is how far below peak young adult bone mass your bone mass is. Um, basically for lumbar spine or lower, lower back and for hip, uh, different components of the hip. Um, and so the World Health Organization decided to grade these, um, these T-scores. Uh, and um, let me go through the grading with you. You actually have this on your handout. Um, but a T-score that is anywhere above minus one is considered normal. And this, for those of you who were wondering how we get these minuses, this is a, what we call a standard deviation. There is a normal, for any of you who have had statistics, there is a, what we call a normal distribution curve, which is essentially for any person of uh, any given age, uh, their bone densities will range over spectrum. And where the average is, is the normal, is the mean. Uh, and then as you go further and further, either above it or below it, you have a, another uh, term called a standard deviation. And so these are actually standard deviation scores. And so anything up to minus one standard deviation below the normal uh, adult young adult peak bone mass is, is fine. Once you get to a score between minus one and minus 2.5, uh, the World Health Organization calls this osteopenia. You may have heard the term. This is mild bone loss. It's something we need to be concerned about. It's like the yellow light as on a traffic signal. Be careful, it's gonna change. Um, and then anything lower than minus 2.5 is, 
is defined as osteoporosis, which is the most severe form of bone loss. Um, the only exception to this is that a low trauma fracture of either the hip or, or a compression fracture of any of the vertebrae are considered to be osteoporosis regardless of T-score. That's the exception. Uh, the important point here to remember is that, and this is where the WHO scoring system comes in, is that for every drop in, every one point drop in T-score, the fracture risk doubles compared to that of a normal young adult. So therefore, if you have osteopenia with a T-score of minus one, your fracture risk is twice what you would, it would have been when you were 25. If your T-score then becomes minus 2.5 or osteoporotic, your fracture risk is gonna be five times that of, a, of you when you were 25. So that's something to bear in mind. That's the value of the WHO uh, system. Um, currently, we don't treat patients with osteopenia. Uh, we do treat patients with osteoporosis. So the next issue then becomes, let's see how I'm doing here, oops. Uh, <clears throat> what drugs are available to, uh, to treat these uh, people who've got osteoporosis. And there's a long list here. Uh, I'm going to try to be fairly brief. The first on my list is hormone replacement therapy. That works. <coughs> um, it's worked for a long time. Uh, probably, in fact, uh, for in most, up till recently, the gold standard. Um, the problem is that the Women's Health Initiative, uh, in, oh, maybe 10 years ago, published this huge study that showed that a, a significant number of women who were taking hormone replacement therapy had an increased risk for both breast and ovarian cancer. And that appeared to be a warning signal. And so since that publication, many people have, some people still opt for this, or at least to a limited extent, they'll opt for hormone replacement, but the majority of people no longer do. Um, so that left us a bit lost for uh, what to do here. And um, so there were several other classes of drugs that we've developed over the years, and they're still coming out. Uh, many of them are quite hopeful. Uh, the first group I want to talk about are what we call the SERMs, just because we were talking about uh, estrogens. The SERM stands for Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulator. And what this basically means is that these drugs are supposed to have the same effect as estrogens on the bone, but they've been changed to the extent that you don't have the side effects uh, that would put you at increased risk for uh, ovarian or breast cancer. And in fact, you may have heard of some of these drugs. Uh, tamoxifen was the first, and raloxifene followed that. Both drugs are effective in protecting against development of breast cancer, uh, and they're often used for that reason. Uh, the problem with them is that they are not effective, or as effective, as most of the other drugs on the market uh, in uh, protecting uh, against bone loss. <coughs> and uh, they carry the additional risk of these DVTs or deep vein thromboses. So they're used. Um, people use them and there's, there's real, as long as you know what the, the risks are and, and what the expected outcomes are, it's, it's a reasonable choice in many instances. The largest category of drugs are the anti-resorptives. This is where you block the resorption of bone. And um, most commonly used class of drugs 
and actually the first to come out were the bisphosphonates. And the way these act is that they, uh, they this is a, a, a compound that, or there are a whole class of compounds that are taken up by the bone matrix, by the, the not the cells so much, but the, the, the calcium phosphate hydroxyapatite crystal that makes the bone hard. This is what it sticks to. But as the bone breaks down, these osteoclasts or bone breakdown cells happen to take up the bisphosphonate because it's there. Uh, it's in the matrix. So they take it up and then the bisphosphonate winds up poisoning these osteoclasts. And so eventually they can't function. And so bone resorption slows down. This is a very, uh, these, this whole class of drugs are very effective in stopping, actually almost completely, bone resorption. And uh, some of the drugs you may have heard of, uh, I go mainly by generic drugs rather than, uh, generic terms rather than the brand names, but uh, Olendronate or Resedronate are the two most common that are given uh, orally. Uh, then intravenously you can have uh, Pomidronate, Ebandronate, or Zalendronate. Um, these drugs are the least expensive. They're first-line drugs covered by insurance companies, including Medicare. Um, they're effective in preventing further bone loss. Uh, they may act to stabilize muscle mass. Um, their disadvantages is that these, this class of drugs uh, does not really replace the lost bone. Um, there is about a 1% risk of fractures of the femur, which is the thigh bone. Uh, those are usually uh, require uh, surgery to fix. Uh, and then there is a very small risk of what we call osteonecrosis of the jaw, which basically means some dead bone developing in the jaw. It's painful. It occurs primarily in patients with cancer who are getting intravenous doses of bisphosphonates in very large quantities. So it's very unusual to get this. The vast majority of chronic bisphosphonate users do not have these complications and do benefit uh, from the use of the drug. Um, there is a newer anti-resorptive drug uh, which is a little different. It's called denosumab. Um, some people know it as prolia. I think it's still on patent. And this is a synthetic antibody that's against a substance made by the bone forming cells uh, which stimulates the bone marrow to produce the bone breakdown cells. The name of this substance is called rank ligand, and I'm not going to go into the long term, but if you remember rank or rankle, uh, R-A-N-K-L, that's in your handout. Uh, this, is the, this is the guilty party, and this is the substance that is uh, targeted by this, what we call monoclonal antibody. Uh, this is convenient in that it's given under the skin by injection twice a year, which doesn't sound too bad, and it also is able to increase bone mass, unlike the bisphosphonates. Uh, so it can give you some new bone back. Um, disadvantages, it's costlier, may not be covered by insurance, especially un unless you demonstrate that bisphosphonates don't work. Um, and um, it seems like the side effects from the anecdotal reports we have are the same as the bisphosphonates. So that you may get the atypical fracture of the femur or thigh bone. You may get the osteonecrosis of the jaw. Uh, again, probably not in very large numbers of patients, but the drug is still new enough that we don't have the, the numbers as we do for the, uh, for the bisphosphonates. There are also 
a few bone forming drugs. These are relatively new. The first one is actually parathyroid hormone. And this is, it sounds a little strange because this is what we talked about is in vitamin D deficiencies actually washing out your bone, breaking it down to normalize the blood calcium. Well, as it turns out, it depends on how the PTH is given. When we break bone down, the PTH release from the parathyroid glands is continuous. So I mean, you just have the steady stream of it coming out. But if you pulse it, if you give it once a day, for example, then the effects are different and it actually forms bone. And it is probably the most effective bone forming drug that we have right now. Um, so if you've had a hip fracture or you've had some other major uh, fragility fracture with low bone mass and you know, clear osteoporosis, this may be the drug for you. Um, the, uh, so that's the advantage. Uh, the, it also has no known significant side effects as do the bisphosphonates at this point, except that, of course, the disadvantage is it's expensive. Uh, the route of administration is by injection under the skin every day for anywhere from one to two years. Some people may not be able to tolerate that. And then the other thing, which is very controversial, but which currently is the way things are. Um, it was Lilly that did a, a study for every drug that you develop, you have to do, uh, you, you have to look at um, uh, what they call carcinogenic potential. And so they gave these, their test rats absolutely industrial doses of PTH. And when they did that, they found that there was an increased incidence of a tumor called osteogenic sarcoma which is a tumor that occurs primarily in younger people, uh, something that I think one of Ted Kennedy's sons had at one point and required an amputation of his leg. Um, so as a result of this rat study, even though there, it's never been demonstrated in any other animal, including monkeys, um, and it's been in fact given to children uh, as hormone replacement, in fact, this drug has a black box warning uh, put on there by the FDA that says it cannot be given to children. Um, there is, however, a new bone uh, forming drug that's just uh, completing clinical trials. Actually, there are two of them, but the one that I think is closest is called, it's another one of these synthetic monoclonal antibodies. It's called blososumab, uh, and it doesn't work through PTH. Uh, so it may turn out to be safer um, for children. But again, this is way too early to know. So let's go fairly quickly now to preventing bone loss. Um, the first thing I'll tell you about that is, despite what you've heard, nothing prevents bone loss. What you, what you might be able to do by a judicious diet and exercise is um, to cause these changes to occur more slowly. Uh, and maybe they won't be as severe. So for diet, basically two things. I, you know, Sue Kwan's gonna talk to you about this in, in a lot more detail. I will just tell you that <clears throat> people should take vitamin D as a supplement. Uh, what's currently recommended is 1,000 international units per day. Uh, some people will tell you to only take D3. I think the merchants know this and they will, and they'll jack up the price of D3. Uh, in fact, D2 is just as effective. So either one, but 1,000 units a day is, uh, is, is a reasonable amount to be taking. Uh, the, uh, in terms of calcium, one point I'm going to make, uh, for the, the general requirement for adults is about 1,300 milligrams a day, 1.3 grams. Uh, Sue so Kwan will talk to you a little bit more about that and how you get it. There have recently been, how many of you are taking calcium supplements? Wow, okay. There, are, there, there have been recent reports that were epidemiologic, and I have some 
problems with epidemiologic studies because you never quite know, you know whether this is an artifact or not. But people have published in reputable journals like the British Medical Journal that taking calcium supplements, at least in, lo in significant quantities, can result in an increase in blood vessel calcification. And we don't, in the research community, we don't really see the mechanism for this. We're, we're not sure we understand how this could occur. Um, we tend to not want to believe it. But it's hard to prove uh, that it's not occurring, that, it, that it's an artifact. Uh, so because we can't prove it at this point, because we can't reassure people that this is not a concern, is we've been recommending that everybody make the maximum effort to obtain as much calcium as possible from the diet uh, and minimize the amount of calcium supplementation that you take. And if you take a vitamin D, supplement, I would suggest that you take pure vitamin D supplement um, just so that you don't have to say, well, gosh, in order to get my vitamin D, I have to have this amount of calcium. Um, try and separate the two. Again, I'm going to leave that part to Sue Kwan. The other issue is exercise. The, you know, the, imp the important type of exercise to get daily is weight bearing. Um, there are some wonderful exercises that, such as swimming that are terrific for the cardiovascular system, but they don't do anything for the bones. Uh, so nothing wrong with swimming. I would encourage that, but make sure that you have at least 30 minutes a day of weight bearing exercises such as walking, jogging, or jumping. I realize that this is an issue for people who have, are not able to do this. And the result of that, and, and this is still a major issue for uh, all of us. And it's one of the reasons why we're also looking into finding out exactly how these, these mechanisms of bone loss occur so that we can uh, come up with some drugs that might be able to substitute. One last quick word about um, bone health. We have a clinic in uh, Gal, and actually it's here at Victory Lakes, uh, twice a week, twice a month. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to describe a bit who comes to this clinic, what do we do, and what our goal is. Um, patients, uh, we, the people who come, are patients who were treated for low trauma fractures, or patients felt by their primary care physicians. Uh, or referring specialists to be at increased risk for low trauma fractures. Um, they, and as I said, they include people who, uh, with postmenopausal osteoporosis, osteoporosis of the elderly, chronic inflammatory diseases, which we've talked about, type 2 diabetes, even chronic lung disease and obesity. Uh, what do we do? Well, we evaluate bone mineral density. We check blood levels of vitamin D and parathyroid hormone. We check important mineral levels in the blood, such as calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. Other tests can be done uh, on an individual basis, depending on what the screening test results are. Uh, and if indicated, specific drug treatment will be recommended, uh, as well as consultation with a dietitian or a physical therapist. And the goal of our clinic is to prevent second fractures in those who have already experienced a fracture, and to prevent first fractures and those who are at risk but have not yet suffered a fracture. Okay. And this is Suquan Jolly, and she is a nutritionist that is over at our Center for Obesity and Metabolic Surgery right here in Victory Lakes, and she helps people manage their nutrition daily. So thank you for being here, Suquan. Thank you, Dr. Mir, and everyone here at Lunch Bunch. So my talk is not on a PowerPoint because I want to do something more fun and more interactive. So I have a bag full of food. So what's a dietitian without food? So I need your participation. I'm gonna just 
Maybe I can have maybe Stacy pass around. So there are um, foods in here. Some of them are just the packages of the food, and some of them are have food in them. Mm -hmm. But I just want um, just take one item. There's not enough for everyone, but just hold on to it and then flip to the side that has the nutrition facts. So we're going to use this in part of the the lesson today. So I've got several items here, and I want you to tell me which of these foods do you think has the most calcium content? Okay, so I have up here sardines. This is a three ounce little can of sardines. So I'm going to put this right here. This is uh, two percent milk. And this is actually a, a two cup container, but the serving would be eight ounces or about this size. So I'm going to put this like here. So we've got sardines, we have milk, we have a six ounce yogurt. It's, you know, no particular brand doesn't really matter, but six ounces of yogurt from milk. Two string cheeses. So this is a craft, you know, it doesn't matter what brand, but this is like mozzarella string cheese, two of them. Although one serving is a serving is one, but for this purpose I'm I'm showing you two of them. This is blackstrap molasses, which not many people use, but you know, it is a source of calcium. That bottle costs sixteen dollars. Yes, that's why I'm taking it back home with me. <laughs> and then we have here um, multigrain Cheerios, and this is about two and a quarter cup. So when it's put into a cereal bowl, it looks like this. Okay, so we've got here blackstrap molasses. I'm gonna put them in alphabetical order. Blackstrap molasses, we've got cheese sticks. We've got yogurt, Y's down here. We've got cereal, so that goes here. We have sardines here and milk, okay? So which one of these, let's, let's vote on the yogurt. Who thinks the yogurt has the most calcium? Don't be afraid. So we got a couple there. Okay. We have a three ounce package of sardines. Do you think this one has more calcium? Okay. Okay. We've got one cup of 2% milk. Nobody wants that one. <laughs> Two sticks of string cheese. Nobody wants this one. Dairy's getting the real shaft. Okay. Two, two and a quarter cups of multigrain Cheerios. It's a pretty big bowl. Big bowl of cereal, no takers on that. And then this is one and a half tablespoons of blackstrap molasses. Okay, you know what? They're all the same. Believe it or not, I know. This is like, this is like the magic trick. Okay, so all of these and the servings that I have shown you have about 300 milligrams of calcium. And you can actually like take the back of this and look and see you know, that it's about 300. So it's, you know, give or take a little bit. Is so, yogurt any different than Greek yogurt? Well, you know, it really depends on the label. So that's what we're going to get into next. So each of you have an object, okay? So I want you to, and I have my little, my little demo here. So Dr. Klein mentioned that, you know, that the recommendation that he gives to his patients for calcium intake is a total of 1300 milligrams a day. So here's my bone, which is like a thermometer for calcium here. And I wanna tell you that non-dairy sources of calcium for the average American person provides about 250 milligrams a day. So without even eating dairy, you're kind of all the way up to 250. Why? Because we eat things like uh, greens and fortified cereals and breads and things like that. So who has, um, who has a, an example of a non-dairy food? So dairy are things that come from, from milk, from cow's milk. So, okay, so what do you have and what is it? Okay, edamame is what? Soybeans, it's the young soybean pod, okay. So that product has a calcium, it's labeled in a percent. So if you have a food label, the back of the food label doesn't have a milligram amount. So this is what gets people confused, okay. So this is in a percent because it's a percent of a daily value of adequate intake for calcium. Actually, this label assumes that adequate intake is 1,000 milligrams a day. So if we do a simple math and we just add a zero at the end of the percent, we'll get the actual milligram. So I'm not going to go through the mathematical reason why that is, but trust me, just add a zero and you're going to get it. So what does it say for the soybeans? 4%. So that would be 
four O. So that means that one serving, which isn't very much, of edamame is about 40 milligrams of calcium. So that is a non-dairy food, and it kind of comes into this washout area of 250. And I actually have, Dr. Mir has behind her, samples of edamame. So if you guys want to pass this around, or we can, you can just take one for sanitary reasons, just pick the top one, and you can taste a, an edamame. And it's, don't eat the pod because you're going to gag on it. But you basically just kind of pop it in your mouth until the, the bean pops out. So if you snack on edamame, that would be a source of calcium, a small source. Who else has a non-dairy food item? OK, so we've got the cereal back here, sir. What does that say? So multigrain Cheerios. So 10, yeah. So 10% would be 100 milligrams, right? So that's the reason why it takes three servings of cereal to get 30%. I mean, yes, yes. So this is a lot of cereal. So fortified uh, cereals and breads. Who has the, the English muffins out there? So what does that say, one English muffin? 10%. 10%, so that's 100 milligrams. So let's get into some of the dairy, or the dairy foods. Um, we'll go back to the non-dairy sources. So who has a dairy food? Does anyone have a dairy food? OK, there's not a lot out there. So there's the string cheese back there, ma'am. What does it say for one string cheese? 15, so we're getting up there. So when you have a food like soybeans, um, it's sort of on the smaller end. It's a source of calcium, not very high. It's at 40 milligrams a serving. Then we get into dairy foods, and we get up into the over 100. So who has <coughs> cottage cheese? So cottage cheese is what percent? 10 percent, because a serving is only half a cup, and it's watery. So that water dilutes you know, the amount of calcium you're getting in the food. So that means like if you have a, a, a drier cheese, like string cheese or like a hard cheese, you're going to get more calcium. You're going to be 150, 200. And so cheeses, like um, drier cheeses, are going to be about 150 to 200. Um, you have the wetter cheeses, like cottage cheese, ricotta, that's going to be maybe 10% or 100 milligrams. And then you have, um, you know, the highest ones are going to be milk itself. So I want you to tell me, what does this say for a cup of milk? 30%. 30%. So your king of the, of the calcium is going to be milk and yogurt. Okay. So the reason why this is only 20%, because this is a 6-ounce yogurt. Whereas if you ate an 8-ounce yogurt, it would be 30%. Yes, you have a question. Does it matter what kind of milk? No. All the milks have the same amount of calcium. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have a question? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want you to tell me what this this protein supplement says for calcium. It's thirty percent. Right. So some protein products. Who has the the Cliff Bar? Someone has the Cliff Bar. So if you're eating a functional food, a food that's been fortified with nutrients, like a protein shake, a slim fast shake, a protein bar, they're going to be on the higher range. And so you're going to get that calcium up pretty quick. So let's look at a typical day. So you're already getting 250 milligrams from your uh, non-dairy sources. What if you have a cup of milk, right? So that's going to give you, what, another 300? <coughs> So now we're up to about, add 300, so we're up to 550. If we had, that's with the milk. So that was one of our dairy sources. What if we had uh, cheese, right? So how much was the string cheese there? It was, it was 150, right. So if we add another 150, what's the math for that? 700, OK. So that was with addition of a cheese stick. So we're kind of, you know, we've had two dairy a day. And, and, you know, sometimes we hear, oh, drink or eat two servings of dairy a day. So you're still a little bit low. I mean, you're, you're up to 700, but you're not quite up to what Dr. Klein says. And so if you have another dairy, let's say you have, um, so, well, I wouldn't count that as a dairy. Not too much calcium in that. But let's say you had like a half a cup of cottage cheese, and then that gets you up to 800. 
So without any special foods that are fortified in calcium, you're only at about 800. And so that's why sometimes you need a supplement. So you're still lacking here about what? 500? So 500 is the amount in products like Viactive or an Oscal, but that's just one serving. So Dr. Klein was saying we have a tendency to over supplement and then end up increasing our risk of the calcification. And so I want, you, the take home message is, get the calcium from your food first, right? Non-dairy and some dairy, if you can tolerate it. And kale? You didn't give them. Yeah, let's get back to kale. So what does it say for kale back there, if you're a big uh, kale eater? It says a calcium 10%. So kale is 100 milligrams for a serving of about two and a half cups raw. So if you're a kale smoothie maker or like you like to cook, you know, greens um, in your diet, you can get about 100 milligrams for that serving, but that's still, you know, that's not as much as like milk, which was 300, or even as much as cheese. And yes, back there. Yes, yeah, so here we have an example of a fortified food. What does that say? So that is a calcium fortified juice, which is 350. So that even beats the milk. But the problem with eating too many fortified uh, foods, like the juices and the waffles and things like that, is that if you're trying to manage your weight, you may have a tendency to overconsume calories just to get the calcium. So can we balance the calcium and the calories so that we don't, we're not gaining weight just trying to chase our bones? So the other thing was the vitamin D. So there aren't a lot of good sources of vitamin D in the diet. Um, you might get some from fatty fish like salmon. Um, you might get some from eggs. And you may get some from special mushrooms that have been uh, grown in UV light. And so you might see those in the grocery store. But usually mushrooms are grown in darkness. But if they're grown specially in UV light, they're, they have a lot of vitamin D. So if you're going to opt for mushrooms, get the ones with vitamin D in them. Otherwise, use a supplement. Um, who has the supplement um, box? And this is probably my last teaching tool. It's just like calcet on it or something. I don't know if someone got that one. But that is a, that's a sample of a calcium supplement. So when you're buying calcium supplements, you're going to find like sea sh or sea oyster shell calcium. You're going to find uh, whatever, all kinds of different calciums. You know, calcium in, um, in most uh, uh, affordable versions are calcium carbonate, which is fine, and there's some that are calcium citrate. So calcium carbonate is better taken with food. It, um, it's better absorbed when, you're, when your stomach has some acid to work on it. Calcium citrate can be taken at any time of the day. So if you, you know, don't tend to remember to take it with a meal, then you might want to try the citrate. But um, I know that we have a lot more we could talk about, but the time's already over. And so I can stay for a few minutes and answer questions. Um, but there's, if you want any more information about diet and bone health, you might want to try the National Osteoporosis Foundation, nof.org. And they have lots of different um, uh, resources there as well.